the P electron and the 1S electron, well, the X-ray that goes out has that amount of energy. Um, the situation of the core hole is, as I said, very unstable. And in fact, the atom doesn't live in that excited state for very long. Uh, within a couple of femtoseconds, that de-excitation process happens and the X-ray goes out. Now, I should mention, although I'm not going to talk about this for the entire rest of the talk, I should mention that there's also the possibility that you can not get an Auger electron. That is the energy difference between the higher line electron and the lower, the lower line electron can be carried away by an electron of the carries that much energy. And it is possible to measure absorption spectroscopy using the Auger electron, um, although, although that is not how it's normally done at my beam line. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about it very much, but you should carry away from this talk that there's this other mode of, uh, of measuring the, the absorption spectrum uh, that involves the Auger electron. Okay, so... Um, one of the lovely things about the preceding few slides is that I haven't really said anything about what element we're talking about. I've talked about atoms in a completely general sense. And it turns out, I, I hope unsurprisingly, it turns out that um, um, this this measurement technique can be applied to any element on the periodic table. So, which means basically everything. The thing about the different elements on the periodic table is that the energy scale that we're talking about for that excitation to happen, uh, it's, it's element dependent. Heavy elements tend to uh, be measured at one kind of beam line and light elements like the things on the first row or the direct measurement of a 2p electron of heavier things, those are done at a different kind of beam line. And so the language, a soft X-ray beam line and a hard X-ray beam line refers to the kinds of instrumentation that are at the beam line to deliver the photons to the sample so that you can make the measurement. The beam line that I operate at the National Synchrotron Light Source 2 here in New York State in the United States um, my beam line is a hard X-ray beam line. So we measure um, the interaction between the incident photon and the 1S electron of all of the elements that are marked in blue. And we measure the direct interaction between the incident photon and the 2P or 2S electrons of the atom for all of the elements that are marked in this sort of funny brownish color. Uh, so by, by tuning the photon delivery of the beam line, and again, I'm going to talk about all of these things in some more detail so that you can fill in the blanks of this picture. Um, at my beam line, we can look at almost the entire periodic table. Uh, it turns out that the details of my beam line are such that we can start at this element, scandium, and measure basically all of the rest of the periodic table heavier than scandium. But if you wanted to do these kinds of measurements on elements lighter than scandium, you would have to go to beam lines that are equipped with different instrumentation. Um, so let me talk in a little bit more detail how this works. Um, so going back to the picture of an atom as like a little solar system, and you have these 1s electrons that are the low-line electrons in the element, the binding energy of that low-line electron, that 1s electron to the nucleus, has something to do with the fact that the electron is a negatively charged particle, and the nucleus is an agglomeration of a bunch of positively charged particles. So electrons and protons, protons in the nu nucleus. Now, the thing about the numbers on the periodic table is that tells you how many protons are in the nucleus of um, are in the nucleus of that of that atom. So as you get more and more protons in the nucleus, 
that is increasing Z number on the periodic table, the positive charge in the nucleus gets bigger and bigger. And the binding between the electron gets stronger and stronger as you go up in Z number. And I wanna show you some examples of that. So for vanadium, which is element number 23, the binding energy of the 1s electron, that is the amount of energy that you need to take the 1s electron and turn it into a photoelectron is 5465 electron volts. If you go up by one on the periodic table to chromium, there's one more proton in the nucleus. The electron is bound a little bit tighter and it takes 5989 EV worth of energy to take that electron out of a chromium atom. And if you go up to the next element, uh, uh, manganese, um, then there's one more proton in the nucleus and it takes even more energy to take the 1s electron out of the manganese atom. All of the shells of an atom behave in the same way However, the higher lying electrons are bound less strongly to the nucleus of the atom than the lower lying electrons. So the 1s electron, the K shell electron in vanadium is, is held in by 5400 EV, but then the 2s, 2p one half and 2p three halves. Uh, so so uh, 2s, whoops, 2s, 2p one half and 2p three halves electrons are held in by significantly less energy because they're the, the higher lying electrons. Um, now, when going back several slides, when this higher lying electron falls down and spits off an X-ray, the energy of this X-ray depends on the difference between these two energy levels. Now, for the different, for the electron coming from uh, one of the 2p states and filling in that 1s hole, then, or the other, you have slightly different energies for that photon that comes off. Okay, the point I'm driving at is that the set of binding energies and the set of emission energies are, are element specific. So vanadium has one set of binding energies and one set of emission energies. Chromium has a different set of binding and emission energies and manganese has a different set. So if you are able on the input channel to control the energy of the incident photons or on the detection channel to discriminate the energy of the photons that are coming off of the sample, then you are able to make element-specific measurements. And this, as I'll get into in a little bit more detail very, very soon, gives is the central power of absorption spectroscopy. That is, that we can make element-specific measurements on materials, even heterogeneous materials that have a lot of stuff in them. To give you an example of this sort of chart for a much heavier element, Here's what that looks like for uranium. Now, uranium is element 92. It has a whole lot of protons in the nucleus. So the 1s electron is bound very, very tightly to the nucleus of the atom, um, 100, almost 116,000 electron volts, very high energy. In fact, the beam line that I work at is not capable of producing photons at that energy. Um, so we cannot measure the 1s, the 1s electron, the interaction with the 1s electron in a uranium atom, we have to measure the interaction with the 2s or 2p electrons because the range of energies that we can deliver at my beam line, about four keV, about four and a half keV to about 23 and a half keV. So these L edges, the inter, the direct interaction with 2s and 2p electrons are something that we can measure at the beam line. So um, again, as long as we have the ability to tune the energy of the incident photons, we can choose 
to do the experiment at the energy appropriate for the element that we want to measure. And that's really the central thing about XFs. Okay, so now I'm gonna take another step back and present um, the X-ray absorption process with another cartoon. So here on the left is a very simple picture of an atom, an isolated atom, which has some kind of potential well. The low-lying electrons live way down here. The valence electrons live way up here. And then here's the Fermi energy and Below that, all the electron states are filled, and above that, none of the electron states are filled. That's how an isolated atom works. Now, if we have an X-ray come into an isolated atom, and that X-ray has enough energy to excite this deep core electron and make a photoelectron and spit it out of the atom, then that photoelectron propagates away from the atom, um, and because we're, you know, we're in a world of quantum mechanics, um, this particle can be, you can think about the particle propagating away with some sort of waveform. That is, there's this uh, inherent uncertainty about whether things on that scale behave as particles or waves, and it really has to do with how you measure things. Um, but there is a characteristic wavelength of the photoelectron that is propagating away. And that wavelength has something to do with the energy of the photoelectron. So if the X-ray that comes in has just barely enough energy to promote the deep core electron, then the photoelectron, which has the amount of energy in the photoelectron is the excess energy between the energy carried by the X-ray and the binding energy of the electron. Whatever is left over after you Un unbind the electron, whatever is left over is the energy of the photoelectron. If it has low energy, it has a very long wavelength, higher energy, and it has a much shorter wavelength. Now, if we um, think about an energy axis, well, there's some binding energy, whatever the, the Fermi energy of the material is, and if the incident X-rays don't have at least that much energy, then they don't interact with the core electron. So if the incident X-ray has less energy than the binding energy of the electron, then it basically doesn't interact with the atom at all. And so if you plot absorption probability in a sort of sideways way against energy, then the probability that an X-ray with not enough energy gets absorbed, that probability is essentially zero. But then as you approach and exceed the Fermi energy, then the probability that that, that, that X-ray interacts with the deep core electron becomes non-zero. And there's some then some non-zero chance of interaction. And as the incident photon gets higher and higher in energy, the probability of interaction sort of tails off exponentially. A very high energy X-ray could just blow right by and never see the electron, but an X-ray with just a little bit more energy than the binding energy has a fairly large probability of interaction. That's pretty interesting all by itself, but what's really interesting is when you go to a situation where instead of just having an absorbing atom isolated in space, if it has neighbors. So now we have a neighbor near the absorbing atom, the photoelectron propagates out and it can scatter off of the surrounding atom if the atom is close enough. <clears throat> There's going to be a scattered portion so that the, the wave, the, the photoelectron wave that propagates out spherically will scatter off of the neighbor. Some portion of that will scatter off of the neighbor and there will be some interference pattern between the outwardly propagating photoelectron and the portion that uh, scatters off of the surrounding atoms. This effect of all of the surrounding atoms has the effect of modifying the probability of interaction between the incident X-ray and this deep core electron. And so on top of this sort of exponentially decaying step function, you get all sorts of interesting oscillatory structure <clears throat> 
which is what gives the x-ray measurement uh, its ability to be useful. It's what lets us determine things about physics and chemistry from these measurements. So let me show you an example. Let's just, just jump right into a simple example. So what I am showing you here are four spectra measured off of uh, materials that contain the element manganese. So the blue one, which is the one that starts turning up farthest to the left, the blue one is manganese metal. And it starts turning up at 6539. And if you remember from several slides ago, 6539 was the, the sort of tabulated number that I gave you for the binding energy of an electron to a manganese atom. The other three spectra in this plot are different kinds of manganese oxide. Manganese oxalate is manganese bound to some kind of uh, 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 organic organic ligand, but it's manganese bound to an oxygen atom, and it's in the manganese two plus state. Um, gamma oxyhydroxide is the green one. It's this third spectra counting from the left. Um, uh, manganese oxyhydroxide is a three plus, is in the three plus chemical state. And then pyrolusite is basically, it's the mineral form of, of MnO2 and that would be a manganese four plus material. Now, the thing that's interesting about this, what, what valence state, formal valence state, what that means physically is that to make the bond between the manganese atom and the oxygen atom, the manganese atom has to give up a little bit more and a little bit more um, charge. Uh, um, it contributes an increasingly large fraction of its valence electrons to the bond. So in the case of manganese two plus, there is less charge around the manganese atom and a little bit of charge compared to the manganese metal. And a little bit more charge has been given up to making the bond with the oxygen atom. In the case of three plus or four plus, the nature of the bond with the oxygen atom is such that more and more charge density is given up from the manganese atom to the bond. With less charge around the nucleus of the manganese atom, there's a little bit less screening of the negative, of the positive charge in the nucleus by the cloud of electrons around the manganese atom. So the binding energy of the deep core electron goes up a little bit as you increase the formal valence as the manganese atom gives up a little bit more charge density, the nucleus is a little bit less well screened, and that 1s electron is held a little bit more tightly to the manganese atom. And as a result, the energy at which this spectrum turns up and becomes non-zero marches up in energy. So the point I am making here is that you can determine the valence state of a metal atom pretty much just by looking at the XF spectrum. If you were given an unknown material, just like a powder of something, and all you knew about it was that it contained manganese, you could identify the valence state, whether it's manganese zero, two plus, three plus, or four plus, just by looking at the spectrum and seeing the approximate energy at which the spectrum rolls up and starts turning into exaths. Now, because every element on the periodic table has its own energy at which this happens, you can do this valence state measurement on any element on the periodic table. And what's more, you don't have to have pure material. You can have something that's very heterogeneous. Let's take one of the most heterogeneous materials I can think of, which is soil, just like dirt from the garden outside. Um, there's certainly a lot of iron in soil. There's a lot of manganese. There's some copper. There's some zinc. There might be uh, some contaminant metals like arsenic or chromium. Uh, there can be a whole sort of witch's brew of the periodic table in 
something as heterogeneous as a soil. But because we can tune the energy of the incident x-rays, incident into the experiment, to the excitation energy of a specific element in the material, we can do this valence state measurement on an element even in a heterogeneous material. So we can, in soil, know what the, the valence state of the manganese in that soil sample is, even in the presence of all of the other stuff, all of the iron, all of the copper, all the carbon and oxygen, all the silicon and aluminum, all of the other stuff that's in the soil, we can still do this measurement on manganese, which is very, very cool. What's more, we have the sensitivity that we can measure down all the way down to about the level of 10 parts per million uh, by weight. So there can be very, very little manganese in a soil sample or whatever element in whatever sample. There can be relatively little of that and you can still measure it. Now, another cool thing, um, Another cool thing is that because x-rays can penetrate deeply into matter, um, it, it's often not very challenging to make your sample. Um, the example I'm gonna show way at the end of the talk, all I've done is gathered up some material and sort of packaged it between two pieces of tape to hold it together, and the x-rays go right through the tape and right into the sample. So it's often very easy to make these samples. Another thing about this measurement technique is that unlike something like x-ray diffraction, um, there's no assumptions of symmetry or periodicity. At no point in the talk so far have I talked about uh, crystal structure in the way that it gets talked about in, say, a diffraction le lecture. So we can do this measurement on crystalline materials, but also amorphous materials, thin films, things that are in solution, things that are surface sorbed, basically any state of matter, we can do the XFs measurement, and we regularly do at, at, the, at the beam line. All right, so. I've already talked, in the last slide I talked about um, how you can tell the difference at a glance between the valence states by seeing where the spectrum turns up. But that's not the only difference between these four spectra. You see that once they get up to the top, the, the oscillations are very, very different up on top. <clears throat> and that gives us, the, all of these, all these features on the spectrum give us a lot more information about what's going on the, in these materials. So in the case of a manganese foil, the manganese is surrounded by other manganese atoms. In manganese oxalate, um, you have some structure, some way that oxygen and carbon atoms are surrounding the manganese atom. And in oxyhydroxide, you have some different way that oxygen and hydrogen atoms are surrounding the manganese atom. And in pyrolusite, yet a different way for oxygen atoms to be surrounding the manganese atom. Now, if we do some data processing, if we, do, if we start working on these data, we can do a thing where we take away the step part of this function and isolate just the oscillatory portion. And you see that one, the oscillations for these four different materials are very different from one another. And two, the oscillations go on for a long time. So I'm showing you data out to um, wave number of 14, where that's the wave number of the oscillations. The plot up here is in energy, the plot down here is in wave number. This plot in wave number corresponds to, um, uh, trying to do some math in my head, about 500 volts above the edge. I'm showing you about 100 volts above the edge in this picture, but you see that the oscillations in these four spectra go on like all the way out to here, maybe even a little bit farther. So like I'm showing you this much in the top plot, but there's data you know, data like this. And there's repeating 
like reproducible characteristic oscillations for each of these materials out to a very high energy. Whenever you have oscillatory spectra, there's sort of one thing that you always do with it, right? There's sort of one natural response to things that oscillate, and that is to do a Fourier transform and to get a, to get a spectrum of the frequencies in uh, the frequencies of the original spectra. So doing a Fourier transform of these oscillatory functions gives us information about the frequency distribution. It turns out if you work out through all, if you work through all the math, what determines the frequencies of oscillation are the distances between the atoms. If you have atoms that are closer together, then the frequency of oscillation is lower and the wavelength is longer. For atoms that are farther apart, the frequency of oscillation is bigger and the wavelength is shorter. That was a very hand wavy explanation of something that we could go into a lot more detail. But the point I'm trying to make is that the locations of these peaks in the oscillatory, in the Fourier transform spectrum, tell you something about uh, how far apart the atoms are. So in the three materials that have oxygens as the nearest neighbor, that have bonding between the manganese and the oxygen, you have these peaks at relatively short distance because the manganese oxygen bond is relatively short. If you squint, you see that the blue one has its first big peak at a much longer distance, which is characteristic of metals. Metal-metal bonds tend to be a lot longer than metal-oxygen bonds. So you can immediately tell the difference between a metal and an oxide. But what's more, you can tell the difference between the different oxides because the peaks just show up at different places. And if you have all of the knowledge that you need to interpret these spectra, and knowledge for those things exist, it is knowable how to interpret, numerically interpret these spectra. You can learn how to do that. Um, you can uh, analyze these spectra and get out interatomic distances, number of neighbors, disorder about that distance, all kinds of structural information to figure out how atoms are arranged around the absorber atom. So the, the point of this slide is that you get this valence, this valence chemistry information, but you get this structural information that says how atoms are distributed around the absorbing atom. Okay. Going to take a little bit of a step back and talk about the output side of the experiment. So I've been talking a lot about changing the energy of the incident photons so that we can measure different measure different elements. I want to talk about the element selectivity of the output channel a little bit now. So what I'm showing you here is the output of a kind of detector that is able to discriminate and quantify the energy of the photons that hit the detector, that hit the face of the detector. So I have a piece, this is a very, uh, a very simple little tool I use at the beamline to help me calibrate my detector. It's a piece of glass that has a known amount of every other element between calcium and germanium um, mixed into this glassy matrix. I hit it with an incident energy a little bit above 11 keV. So uh, you see the evidence of the incident energy here in the elastic peak because there's a probability that some of the photons that hit a sample just bounce off of it like billiard balls without losing any, any energy. You see that here in this peak that I've labeled the elastic peak. So that's how you know, or that's how I can demonstrate that I was indeed at this incident energy. But the thing about this energy is it's above the binding energy of all of these other elements. So there's some probability that a photon that hits the sample will excite the 1s electron in one of these other elements. And so you see that this piece of glass that I said has every other element between calcium and germanium in it does in fact have all of those elements in it because we see peaks 
at this, the locations that are specific to those elements. So this isn't a very interesting sample because it was made to a certain specification. That is, I already know what this sample is. But let's look at something a bit more interesting. Here is a bit of soil from a place in the north, in, it, this, it, it's a, a laboratory called Hanford, um, which is in the state of Washington, which is in the northwest part of the United States. Um, the Hanford lab was one of the two places in the United States where in the 1940s, the US government uh, began developing the nuclear industry. That is, it's one of the places where that where the technologies necessary both for nuclear power and nuclear weapons were developed. Now, it being the 40s and the 50s, they weren't super careful about uh, environmental health and safety concerns. And it turns out that there are places in the Hanford site that are where the soil is heavily contaminated with uranium from the industrial scale processing of uranium uh, for power and military purposes. And now there is, th this wouldn't be a problem except that Hanford is very close to one of the major rivers, the Columbia River, one of the major rivers in the Northwestern United States. And so there is over time some migration of these contaminants from the sediment on the lab into the river. And so there's a whole, a whole industry of scientists who study the fate and transport of uranium and other contaminants through groundwater, through uh, across the minerals that are um, near the surface and farther down in the ground. So, so there's a whole, a whole group of scientists who study things about the chemistry and transport of uranium through these natural systems. Now, what I'm showing you here are the uh, fluorescent spectra are two fluorescent spectra from a sample taken from this Hanford site. Now it's sediment, it's like stuff from the ground. So you see a lot of iron, you see a lot of copper and zinc, the kinds of things that you normally see in soils pretty much everywhere in the world. You see a bit of arsenic, which uh, is another thing that's very common in soils pretty much everywhere in the world. Um, but then you see a lot of other elements that are indicative of uh, the industrial processes that were used at Hanford, including an enormous amount of uranium. So the dominant thing in this soil actually is uranium. This is a very, very heavily contaminated uh, sample of sediment from this place. Now, the difference between the, the blue and the red is the energy of the incident x-ray. The blue has the energy coming into the experiment below the binding energy of the uranium 2p3 halves electron. And so as a result, you don't see the fluorescence from the uranium atom because that incident photon doesn't have enough energy to start the exas process. But you do see this peak that's hidden underneath the peak in red, which has to do with rubidium, which has its emission line is relatively close to the uranium. The detector has some uh, energy resolution that's a, a couple hundred EV. So the peaks are not sharp, but they have some width to them. And we see this rubidium peak hidden beneath the uranium. But when we turn up the energy of the incident X-rays to above the binding energy of the 2p3 halves electron, then we see the presence of the uranium atom show up very strongly. Now, to do the XFs measurement on uranium, similar to what I showed you for manganese, what we do with this kind of detector is we put a little, using electronics, um, we put a window around this peak. In this way, we can ignore all of the rest of the fluorescent signal coming off of the sample and just look at the part that we're interested in. But as we approach the binding energy and start to go up the edge, go up to you know, an energy where the probability of interaction is quite high, we see that red peak will grow, 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 grow. And as we go up over the first peak in the data and down into the first trough of the data, 
that red peak will go up, 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 and then it will go down, and then it will go up again, and it will go down. And so as we change the incident energy through the excess spectrum, the size of that red peak will go up and down and make the oscillations in our excess spectra. And so um, that's how we use the fluorescence signal, not only to measure excess, but also to give us another mode of energy uh, specificity in the excess measurement. So we are measuring the uranium excess, even though there's iron and copper and uh, arsenic and rubidium and yttrium and all of these other things in the sample, we're specifically measuring the uranium content because we're doing the experiment around the binding energy of the uranium and we are specifically looking at the uranium signal. Cool. How do we do all of this? Well, here is a schematic of a typical excess beamline. In fact, it is the schematic of the beamline that I operate at the National Synchrotron Light Source 2. The, I believe it is true that you all have had the lecture on how the photons are generated. So I'm not gonna talk about that at all. Over here somewhere is the storage ring. Over there is the storage ring. X-rays are coming from the storage ring into my beam line. At this point, the X-rays coming off of the source have not been monochromatized. It's very broadband radiation. All of the energies of photons um, from very soft to rather hard are all in the beam coming from the source. The first item that I have at the beam line is a thing that's called a collimating mirror. Now, the reason I need the collimating mirror is that the x-rays from the source, um, from the kind of source that I have, um, it's, I have a very short wiggler at the beam line. Uh, this is not an undulator beam line. Um, one of the differences in properties between undulator and wiggler is the dispersion of the beam the wiggler source is very dispersive. That is, as you go farther and farther away from the source, the spot of x-rays gets bigger and bigger. This is problematic because the distances on the beam line are very large. These numbers along the bottom are telling you how far away from the source every part of the experiment is. And then the, the place where the sample sits is down at about 45 meters away from the source. So if we allowed the beam to just get bigger and bigger as we propagate away from the source, we'd be throwing away a lot of photons because we'd have to cut everything down so that the beam fit on the sample all the way down where the sample sits. So we try and fix that as best we can by passing the beam over a collimating mirror. Now, it turns out without going through the math, but if, if you go through the math of what a parabola is, I think it should be pretty clear that a parabola is the shape that does this. If we take light from a source and hit a mirror that's in the shape of a paraboloid of rotation, then this thing that I've drawn sort of schematically, this drawing isn't very good, but it's, it shows schematically how it works. If we come into the mirror from a source and bounce light off of the mirror, this diverging light off of this paraboloid, we end up with rays that are parallel coming off of the mirror. So we lose a little bit of flux by passing light over the mirror, but what we gain from using the collimating mirror is that instead of having the beam get bigger and bigger, the rays of x-rays are now parallel and go through the rest of the experiment, um, the rest of the photon delivery system without diverging, but being parallel. So it lets us save a lot of flux by collimating the light. Um, going down the beam line, we pass through a bunch of diagnostic tools just to make sure that everything is working correctly. And then we get to the monochromator. And the monochromator is really the business part of an X-ray beam, of an XFS beam line. It's the tool that lets us do the energy selection of the incident X-ray beam. And it works, it's, it's a big complicated device. I mean, you can see, um, uh, you know, this, this vessel that it sits in is more than a meter across. It's got this mechanically complicated uh, thing in here to hold the silicon crystals and hold them in the correct position and at the correct angle and have cooling water flow through and all of this stuff goes on. It's mechanical.
basic physics how a monochromator works is actually quite simple. It's just a, it's just a piece of silicon crystal which has very you know very well defined planes of atoms, and just by doing Bragg diffraction, we can put the crystal at a certain angle relative to the incident beam, and only the photons that meet the Bragg condition off of that piece of silicon will diffract from the silicon. So we can take all energies going into the monochromator <clears throat> and the photons that diffract off of the monochromator are at the, are at the specific energy that we want that is chosen by setting the angle of the monochromator crystal. Um, after the monochromator, we now have pretty close to single energy photons. It's not perfectly like all photons of one energy. There's a very narrow width, um, but the light up here is all energies. The light down here is a very narrow distribution of energies around the energy that we want for the experiment. So that's great. The next two things that we have at the beam line are a couple of different mirrors that we can use for different purposes. Um, I'm gonna step ahead to the third mirror at the beam line, which is the harmonic rejection mirror. If we go back and look at the Bragg equation, we see that it's, you choose an angle and depending upon the lattice spacing of the silicon crystal, <coughs> the, um, the angle you choose determines the wavelength of the x-rays that are going off. Basically, you choose an angle and that wavelength fits just perfectly between the, um, the, planes, of, the planes of the silicon crystal at that angle. But the thing is that if one full wavelength fits, then half that wavelength fits twice and three times, um, yeah, three times that wavelength fits, I, I said that wrong, um, half that wavelength fits twice, one third that wavelength fits three times and so on. So what you really get is the energy that you want plus the higher harmonics coming off the monochromator. So we can use the harmonic rejection mirror, which is just a very flat surface coming in at a grazing angle. And we can choose the angle so that the fundamental, the lower energy photons that we actually want to measure bounce off of the mirror like a mirror, but the higher energy photons from the harmonics diffracting off of the crystal, those will get absorbed by the mirror. So by using the monochromator and the harmonic rejection mirror together, we really do get just the, just the one energy of photons that we want for the XS experiment, adjustable by the angle on the monochromator. The last bit of optics is the focusing mirror which works very similarly to all of the other mirrors. You come in at a very glancing angle, but this one is cut into a very special shape. It's cut into a portion of a cylinder, which is then put in a device that bends it into a torus. So basically the focusing mirror is a piece of a donut. And if you think about how the collimated rays coming in at a glancing angle, uh, the ones that hit one side of the mirror will bounce inward a little bit, and the ones that hit the other side of the mirror will bounce inward the other way. Because the thing is bent in the long direction, the photons that hit the leading edge will be deflected upwards just a little bit. The ones that hit at the tailing edge that's bent up a little bit more will be deflected a, a little bit more all four of those kinds of reflection uh, work together to bring all of those parallel rays focused to a spot somewhere far away, uh, down where the sample is. So by putting the focusing mirror into the beam or taking it out of the beam, we can control whether we have a large spot, which is about eight millimeters across and one millimeter high of X-rays with parallel rays, 
or we can focus all of those x-rays down to a spot that's about 300 microns across so that we can do different kinds of experiments on, um, on, uh, on, on, different, um, on different, sized, uh, different sized samples. Cool. Okay. Finishing up with the instrumentation at the beam line, we have, so this is a picture sort of on a ladder looking down over the experiment. The x-rays are coming from the bottom and propagating this way through the experiment. So x-rays coming from here, going through the experiment like this. The two things marked by yellow dots here are ionization chambers, which are just gas-filled capacitors. So you have high voltage on two metal plates and some gas inside. A little bit of the x-rays are used up to photo excite electrons from say the nitrogen gas that's inside the ion chamber that causes a whole cascade of electrons that makes a little bit of measurable current on the, um, on the positive plate of the capacitor inside of this box. You can amplify that and turn that into a measurement of the incident intensity so that as you change the energy, you can always measure what the flux of x-rays going into the experiment is. The, and we have a, a series of these ion chambers that are used for, used for different purposes. So the simplest x-ray experiment, we simply put a sample in between the first two ion chambers and measure how much gets absorbed by the sample or how much less the signal is in this ion chamber than in this one. And we measure that step with oscillation function um, basically in the same way that you do a uh, Lambert Beer experiment. So the transmission XS experiment is just, it's Beer's law for x-rays. Um, this over here is the fluorescence detector, the thing that is able to do this energy discrimination of all of the fluorescence coming off of the sample. Um, the way that you use the electronics to process that signal, we're able to put that window around the peak of interest in the way that I discussed before. The last important feature of the experiment is the sample stage, which is partly hidden by some of the other stuff here in this picture. <clears throat> but the sample stage is basically a, a collection of, of motor, motorized stages that you can move up and down and back and forth and use them to position the sample correctly in the beam. Now, what's great about this experimental setup is that you can simply have the sample on the stage, but you could also have the sample, say, on the inside of an electrochemistry cell that is hooked up to a potentiostat that is doing an electrochemistry experiment on the sample while we're measuring exafs. So we can, for example, charge and discharge a battery and look at the valence and structure of a metal atom in a battery material as it's being electrochemically cycled. Or we can change temperature, or we can change pressure, or we can do some kind of stop flow chemistry or chemistry under gas flow. All of these things can be mounted in the sample position and we can use the detectors to measure exafs of these real in situ experiments. So we can measure real samples under real conditions that are interesting to the science that the people bring to the to the experiment, to the beam line. So I've, I've mentioned a few times that one of the advantages of this is that x-rays are deeply penetrating. I, I wanna talk a little bit about what that means. So it, it basically has to do with electron density. So suppose that you wanna measure, uh, measure a battery. Um, well, the battery has to be inside of something. It has to be packaged up with, um, a separator, there's anode, there's cathode, there's, um, there's connecting wires, there's all kinds of stuff that's packaged together and usually pressed together in some way. <clears throat> you have to make the packaging appropriate that the x-rays can get through and see the sample on the inside. So if you were to bind your thing up in glass, SiO2, and you were trying to do an element that's pretty low in Z number, well, the penetration depth 
of low energy photons into glass is not very deep. So to let enough x-rays get through to the sample, the glass would have to be very thin. Fortunately, there are lighter things than that. So if you were to bind up your battery, say, in polypropylene film, <clears throat> well, the attenuation length of x-rays penetrating a plastic like that is much, much deeper. So <clears throat> the scale here is very, very different. This is hundreds of microns. This is millimeters. At low energy, you can have like one to two millimeters of plastic and still have plenty of x-rays get through. But you can only have like 50 microns of glass. So, so you can often very easily um, think about how you want to engineer your in situ experiments so that all of the packaging material is appropriate to maintain the state of the experiment on the inside of whatever the thing is, but still let enough x-rays get through. Um, so, so this tends to be an important part of preparation of the experiment. <clears throat> Little bit of vocabulary uh, here at the end of the first part of this talk. Uh, as you read the literature on this stuff, you'll see a bunch of different words. So the zanes is the portion of the spectrum that's very close to the rising edge. And in the hard x-ray community, um, people have often used the word, have always used the word zanes. Whereas in the low energy community, the people who measure this spectrum on things like oxygen and carbon and go to the beam lines that are instrumented to deliver photons of those energies, they, for some reason, have always used the word nexats, near edge x-ray absorption fine structure versus x-ray absorption near edge structure. Um, there's no difference between those two words. They're complete synonyms. It's just a cultural difference for which community uses Zanes and which community uses nexats. But as you read about this stuff, when you come across those two words, it's important to remember that, that they're synonyms. They're the same thing. The rest of the spectrum that in the case of the manganese, I showed you all those oscillations and then we did the Fourier transform and talked about the meaning of, meanings of those peaks. That's often called the XAFs or extended X-ray absorption fine structure. Zanes and extended XAFs together are called X-ray absorption spectroscopy. So that's a quick walk through all of the many acronyms that we have. A bit more vocabulary that you'll hear me saying throughout the rest of my talk. The pre-edge often refers to these first few features that, that often um, are like small, small edges before the main rising edge are often called the pre-edge structure. Um, it's sort of, in terms of physics, it's kind of a troublesome term, but what it's referring to is features before the big rise. The edge is the big rise and the near edge are these oscillations just after. Taken together, uh, these things are, are the zanes. Um, <clears throat> some materials have a first peak that's way, way taller than the rest of the spectrum. And that's often called a white line. And that has a funny historical origin having to do with physicists back in the 1920s and 1930s uh, using photographic film to um, measure this kind of spectrum. And the bit right around here was brighter than the rest of it. And so it came to be called a white line. And we, we've preserved that term, even though it's not very meaningful with modern ways of, of measuring things. Um, okay. So um, we are, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start into the next section, but we're going to take our break um, in about 10 minutes or so. Um, I, I'm going to start talking about the Zanes, uh, but we'll finish up after the break. Um, but I want to start getting into a little bit about the kinds of science that you can actually measure from this and the kinds of science questions that you can answer. So um, here is, uh, the first few slides are, are um, sort of uh, at a glance things that you can do with the Zane spectra before, even before doing some kind of quantitative analysis. So first thing that you can get aside from differences in valence, 
What I'm showing you here are the spectra from, uh, in blue, hexavalent chromium versus trivalent chromium. So uh, six plus versus three plus chromium. And you see that not only are all the features really super different, but there's also this significant difference in the main rising part of the edge, but then chromium is kind of special because it has this enormous pre-edge feature. The point here is that um, chromium six plus is extremely toxic and if you consume it, it will make your lungs stop working. Whereas chromium three plus is basically non-interactive with biology. And if you consume chromium three, three plus, you will excrete it a day later along with everything else. So if you are worried about contamination of chromium in an environmental system, knowing the difference between three plus and six plus is very, very important. And what's lovely about an excess spectrum is you can tell at a glance the difference between chromium three plus and chromium six plus. So if you had some contaminated food or some contaminated soil or some industrial solvent or something like that, uh, you can put it, you can take it to the beam line and immediately see if it's the dangerous kind of chromium or the benign kind of chromium. Um, another form of speciation you can do at a glance. Now, this is a little bit silly. I'm telling you how to tell the difference between silicon dioxide and its crystalline form, that is quartz, versus its amorphous form, glass like what's in like the window of the room that you might that you're sitting in. Uh, and you can see that there are differences in the XF spectra. Now, of course, you can tell those two things apart with diffraction probably easier, but you can see the difference between amorphous and crystalline materials uh, in an XF spectrum as well. Um, another thing about speciation that you can tell at a glance is oxidation state. And so if you look at something that's very spectroscopically rich, like sulfur, which lives in a wide variety of um, valence states, uh, everywhere from two minus to six plus, you see that as you go from two minus to six plus, you see this big peak shows up in different places. And so uh, something like sulfur, uh, phosphorus and chlorine work much the same way. They're very spectroscopically rich and you can tell a lot about uh, the system at a glance with the XF spectra. Um, We've talked about this already, but I wanted to show you another example. This is for rhenium metal. And again, you see this shift in energy from metal through, in the case of rhenium, four plus, six plus, and seven plus. And, and if you somehow quantify where these edges happen, for pretty much every element of the periodic table, you can make, um, you can make lines like this. And so if you have an unknown material, you can plop it down on that line and say, oh, my unknown material probably has this valence state. So these are, you know, these are things that don't require um, very sophisticated analysis. Uh, these last few slides have all been things that you can just tell at a glance from a Zane spectrum. Um, from here, we're gonna start to get a little bit deeper into what the Zanes does. And so uh, Sal, I, uh, does this seem like a good time for everyone to take a break? Oh uh, yeah, we could take a break. Uh, I'm, I'm suggesting that now might be a good time for a break. Is that good? Yes, this is good. Okay. So uh, let's take a 10 minute break. And uh, if you have any questions, type them in the uh, Q&A section and we'll answer them when we come back from the break. Uh, yeah, I've, I, I saw that Renee put in a question and I will certainly be answering it when we get back. And hopefully there will be more. All right, everyone. I'll see you, uh, I'll see you in a few minutes. 
All right, if uh, everybody's back, uh, we're going to get back into uh, the lecture. Uh, Dr. Bruce Rebell, if you want to answer the questions, you're muted. Uh, Bruce, you're muted. Yeah, I'm muted. Yes, okay. yes, I, I realized that as I was starting to talk. It is, uh, it's a very modern thing, right, that, uh, that unmute has become a big part of the workday. There's four really, really great questions here. I'm very excited about the questions. So the first one, um, I'm asked, the shifts in energy can occur between elements with the same oxidation state, but let's say organic and inorganic compounds. And yeah, that's that's a, a really good question. So um, uh, you can, let me go back a slide. So you can come up with a line like this uh, measured in some manner for different oxides of a metal. You could, for example, have a similar range of oxidation states, but for sulfides. Um, and the same behavior will happen. There will be a step up in energy for where the rising edge happens for the higher valence state of the sulfides, but the positions for the oxides and the positions for the sulfides will not be the same. The, the lines, these lines will be different. So um, uh, that is a good thing in the sense that you can get this, this valence information for uh, oxygen bound, oxygen ligands and all other kinds of ligands, but it does add an element of complexity to trying to understand a real system. So if you were looking, for example, at a chemical reaction that was a, a, a sulfidation reaction, so you were seeing uh, an oxide be transformed into a sulfide, um, say under the flow of, of, of hydrogen sulfide, for example, or in reverse under the flow of oxygen. It could be a little bit complicated to interpret the spectra because you could have multiple valence states of oxygen and multiple valence states of a sulfide in the same system. Um, so uh, the, the short answer is yes. Uh, the sort of complicated answer is it's complicated and you might have to do some real, like some real thought might have to go into the interpretation of that kind of experiment. But uh, excellent question. The next question is um, about uh, mixed valence complexes. So for example, you wanted, you had some, uh, some mixture of copper one or copper two, or say iron two or iron three, is Zane's able to distinguish uh, the difference between these two metal ions? The answer is absolutely yes. And I'm going to, in fact, the very next slide, I, uh, the, the very next slide after where I stopped, I'm going to start answering that question. And in a short bit, I'm gonna show you a, a more complete answer to that question. Um, uh, that's a really, really great question in the sense that a very significant fraction of the experiments that come to the beam line are trying to tell exactly that. They have mixed valence systems and they need to know what the mixture is because that mixture correlates to something about uh, the processing conditions of the material or the environmental conditions of the sample. So great question. Um, next question is uh, about... Uh, XPS or uh, photo emission spectroscopy uh, versus absorption spectroscopy in terms of determining oxidation state. Um, uh, well, for one thing, XPS is way, 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 way easier for most people to do because you people often have uh, um, uh, an instrument in their home lab to do XPS with a, uh, a fixed anode source. And so uh, XPS is often much, much easier to do. The big win of something like XFs over XPS has to do with the, how the sample is measured. So XPS, you are measuring the oxidation state of the atoms that are within a very small skin of the surface of the sample because the escape depth of the electrons is measured in nanometers. So you are only measuring the oxidation state of the elements that are near the surface. Now, that's often exactly what you want because, for example, a lot of chemistry happens at the surface of things. So often XPS is exactly the right tool. However, it is 
only a measurement of the surface. XF has highly penetrating hard x-rays that can go quite deep into the sample, possibly even through the entire bulk of the sample. So you are getting a bulk measurement of the, um, of the valence state as opposed to a surface measurement. So very often people do both XFs and XPS on their samples to distinguish the differences between bulk and surface effects. The other thing about an XFs experiment is that it is much, much easier to do an in situ experiment with XFs than with XPS because of this escape depth problem of the XPS measurement. So for example, to do XPS on an operating battery is not completely prohibitively difficult, but it's an awfully challenging experiment because you have to contrive the whole battery experiment in such a way that not only can you get the x-rays into where the sample you're interested in is, but get the electrons out to be measured. Whereas with hard x-rays, getting the x-rays in and out is relatively easy. So um, XPS, easier to do for most people than XS because it doesn't require a trip to the synchrotron but it's surface sensitive and hard to do in C2. XS is difficult because it requires a trip to the synchrotron. It's a bulk measurement and you can do it in C2. I think that's the complete answer to that question. Uh, last, last question is about the escape peaks and the Compton peaks in, uh, in the spectra. Uh, so this person is asking about these peaks and these peaks over here. So, um, the escape peaks are this, uh, so the, the, the incident, the, the photons that are coming into the detector can, um, can um, uh, will, will, will generate current that can be measured as what they are. But the thing is, is those photons coming into the detector, if they're high enough energy, uh, those photons can excite the germanium atoms that are in the detector or the silicon atoms that are in the detector. And the, 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 the escape peaks then have to do with, um, um, have to do with that sort of secondary effect of the elements in the detector themselves being excited by the photons that are coming in and measuring. There's usually a significant separation between the thing that you want to measure and the escape peak. But when you plot the data over a broad energy range like this, you're going to see the escape peaks. And you have to be mindful of the fact that one of the features in the spectrum might be contaminated by these escape peaks. The, uh, they're generally just waste in the measurement. They're a thing that you have to deal with, but they don't provide useful information. The Compton, the easiest way to think about Compton is that in whatever the sample is, there is some kind of sea of electrons that constitute the material. And the photons that come in and hit the sample have some non-zero probability of exciting some kind of collective excitation in the sea of electrons in the material, such that they lose a little bit of energy, an amount of energy that's measured in the tens or hundreds of electron volts. And so instead of just seeing the elastic peak, you, as you go to higher and higher energy, you see an increasing probability of measuring this Compton peak, uh, which is energy shifted downwards because a little bit of energy has been lost to a collective excitation in the sample so that the photon that bounces off is a little bit lower energy. Uh, Compton spectroscopy is a thing and can be used in certain situations. It's not a thing I'm deeply familiar with, but you can, um, you can go Google the phrase Compton spectroscopy and you can learn how that's used in materials science. But it's not something I'm real, really prepared to talk about in any greater depth right now. But again, great question. I, I'm very excited by uh, how good all of those questions were. Um, hopefully at the, uh, we'll, we'll leave a little bit of time at the end. There can be time for more questions at the end. Um, but thank you, thank you for those. It's, it's always great to get, to get such good questions. Um, cool, cool, cool.
So to get at the first fellow's question, to begin getting at the first fellow's question, oh, let me start my timer again. To begin getting at the first fellow's question, um, here is a sort of artificially created uh, mixture sample. So I'm showing you two different valence states, uh, trivalent and uh, pentavalent uh, vanadium. Um, and then I just, I made a mixture by taking a little bit of one and a little bit of the other and mixing them together and measuring the XFs on that. And you see that um, uh, the mixture then has a rising edge that's somewhere in between because you're adding up a little bit of the blue and a little bit of the red to make the green. The pre-edge peak is a little bit lower because it doesn't have quite all of this. It has some of this mixed in and, you know, uh, sort of all the way through, you see something that's a mixture of the two. Um, the interesting thing about this, this relates very closely to the first question uh, th that person asked about, um, about different valence states with different ligands. You can see that there's a lot of different effects that can go on in real samples. Mixtures or different ligands can all cause similar, uh, similar effects in that there can be shifts of the shifts of where this rising edge is. So it's in most situations, it's a little bit more complicated than just looking at the spectrum and knowing what's going on. You have to do a little bit of analysis and bring a little bit of knowledge to the situation. But I'm gonna show you an example of that shortly. Um, here is an example of using the XFs to measure uh, a time sequence so that you can get a sense not only of what chemical reaction is happening, but also the time scale over which it's happening. So what you're seeing here is um, you have chromium deposited on a manganese oxide surface, and the chromium is being oxidized by, um, by, the, manganese, uh, by the manganese surface. That is, the manganese has an excess of oxygen that it can contribute to the oxidation of the small amount of chromium that is deposited on the surface. And you see that over the course of a few minutes, this peak indicates that you are seeing the chromium-3, which you might recall from a few slides ago, is the benign low pre-edge peak version of chromium. You see it evolving into the scary high pre-edge peak form of chromium. And so this kind of in situ chemical reaction time dependent experiment is a thing that we can um, we can measure with XFs and you can just simply like look at peak height as an indicator of a chemical reaction. So that's that's a pretty cool example. Uh, here is a direct example of something about the first question. Um, I'm showing you uh, examples of both uh, arsenic and iron with oxygen or sulfur ligands. You see, um, you see that uh, for, for the arsenic, three plus and five plus, three plus and five plus, the blue and red are the oxygen bound arsenic. The green and purple are the sulfur bound arsenic. They show the same behavior in terms of a step up in edge energy, but the edges happen at slightly different energies because of the difference in chemistry between oxygen and sulfur. Um, here uh, is a similar example for iron. You see the difference between iron two plus that is oxygen bound. Um, that's just wurzite. This is uh, um, um, pyrite, iron pyrite, uh, fool's gold. Um, also iron two plus, but bound to sulfur. And you see that there's a shift in the edge energy and huge differences in the, the structure of the wiggles above the spectrum. So um, again, you can often tell things at a glance in a Zane spectrum, but to really get the complete picture, you might need to bring some more knowledge to the measurement that you're making. Um, so uh, now I wanna talk about um, uh, some, um, some more in-depth, we're sort of going increasingly in-depth of analysis. So now I'm um, going to talk about uh, some fingerprinting tools that we can use, that is to, to do some kind of identification by a distinctive characteristic in the spectrum. So what I, this picture that I'm showing you here um, from a, a paper from quite long ago, but it's a really cool example 
This shows, this is the um, uh, chromium K edge spectrum taken from um, coal ash. So coal is burnt to produce power or you know, heat up water or do all the things that we do industrially with coal. Um, the byproduct of power generation with coal is that you get these mounds of, of ash, mostly just carbonaceous material. But whatever elements were in the coal going in are still in the ash going out. And when the ash is disposed of, you now might have an environmental problem to deal with. So comparing this original spectrum, oh, another thing to mention is that there's not very much chromium in coal. Um, the problem with chromium in coal is that is that we go through lots of it. And so the mounds of coal ash are quite large. So even though the concentration of chromium is really small, in the aggregate, we're talking about a lot of chromium. But the concentration is really small. It's tens or hundreds of parts per million by weight. But we can still measure such things. Even if the data are really noisy, we can still clearly measure such things. Now, the sample as gathered of the coal ash, it doesn't look like either chromium three plus or chromium six plus, it in the sense of the vanadium example in the sense of the question that that person asked is some kind of mixture of three plus and six plus. That is this peak is there, but it's not as big as the similar peak in chromium six plus indicating that we have some kind of mixture of these two species in this coal sample. Now what they were looking at in this paper <clears throat> is how you can process the coal ash to extract or maybe extract the chromium or maybe chemically convert the chromium. So when you just wa like wash water over the coal ash, it doesn't do very much to reduce the amount of chromium-6. And we know that because this peak is not very much smaller relative to the size of the edge step. But when you wash the coal ash with acidic water, uh, the acid in the water is really good at reducing the chromium, reducing what chrome six there is down to chrome three. So the point of this paper is that if you wanted to process coal ash and leave something behind that was safer to dispose of, you would need to do uh, this post-processing of the ash in one way rather than the other way. And this doesn't require a very sophisticated analysis. We can clearly see that that's the case just by looking at the pre-edge peak. Um, another thing we can do is sort of categorize groups of spectra. So I've been showing you a few examples of very common materials, but as you start to look at the heterogeneity of things in the broader world, there's lots of little differences in the, in the Zane structure of the, of the materials. So in this paper here, these people went and measured a few dozen different minerals that contain titanium. And um, when you when you process the Zanes data for different kinds of titanium, depending upon the symmetry of the coordination, whether the titanium is surrounded by four oxygen atoms, five oxygen atoms, or six oxygen atoms, you get features in the pre-edge that are at a position and of a height that fall into four broad categories. <clears throat> where the fourfold ones, the peak is really high and at relatively low energy, whereas in the sixfold ones, the peak is really small and at considerably higher energy. So what you can do with a characterization like this is measure something unknown. So some folks came to my beam line, they had this material called zirconolite that had been processed in a few different ways. Um, one of the ways of processing it left it clearly in a six-fold state because its pre-edge peak clearly is associated with this cluster. But after, after, after processing the material in certain ways, it's been reduced to a five-fold coordination. And so this is, again, something that is done with a small amount of analysis, but not in-depth analysis by doing this sort of categorization of features of a broad set of spectra. Again, a fingerprinting approach.
Um, another little fingerprinting approach is something that I've talked about a little bit already. And that is uh, the amount of local disorder. Um, so <coughs> things of the perovskite structure are very interesting in general to material scientists because uh, they're the basis for all kinds of ferroelectric and ferromagnetic and uh, dielectric and all kinds of different interesting materials that have different interesting properties interacting with electro electric and magnetic fields. Um, a, um, a broad category of these things that are very widely studied are the titanium bearing perovskites. The basic perovskite structure has um, uh, oxygen atoms in the red positions. Uh, the titanium is the gray one at the center of a cube of the other element. Uh, the data I'm showing have, one of them has europium as the green atom, the other one has lead as the green atom. The oxygen atoms in europium titanate are at the faces of these cubes, right in the center of the faces. Uh, that means that the titanium is sitting in an octahedron surrounded by six oxygens that are all at the same distance. <coughs> you see in europium titanate, relatively a relatively small feature as this first feature in the spectrum. Lead titanate, the nature, the chemical nature of lead, the way lead bonds with things leads to an interesting phenomenon in these materials. Lead titanate is distorted. Uh, uh, the, the language we use is tetrahedrally distorted. That is, it's, it's stretched out like this along one axis so that the cube is stretched in one dimension, but the other two dimensions are the same length. And these octahedra are also stretched in that direction. And what's more, the titanium atom ends up at a position that's not right at the center of the stretched cube and not right at the center of the stretched octahedron. So there's all kinds of structural distortion on the local scale in lead titanate relative to europium titanate. And you see that at a glance because of this peak. I could go into a lot of depth of what like the physics behind the appearance of these peaks. It has to do with um, um, states that come out of a gap in the electronic structure of these materials. I could go on for quite a long time about that. It's sort of beyond the scope of what we're talking about. The point I'm making is that armed with a little bit of knowledge of how these materials work, you can look at the size of this early peak in the spectrum and know whether your perovskite is a true cubic material, like europium titanate, like strontium titanate, or if it's distorted in some way, like lead titanate, like barium titanate. And these are things that you can tell at a glance um, by looking at that peak. Uh, it, you can tell something about the amount of distortion from beautiful centrosymmetry, like in European titanate, how much distortion there is away from centrosymmetry at a glance in the spectra. Um, I'm going to skip this slide just so that I can carry on. This was a few words explaining what was going on with these peaks. Very interesting topic. I think I need to move on, though. Um, now I'm going to talk about some of the ways that we analyze Zane's data. Uh, the first one I think will address um, a couple of the questions that were asked at the intermission. So the assumption in linear combination fitting, so LCF is linear combination fitting or linear combination analysis. The <clears throat> The assumption in this kind of analysis is that if you take two materials and take a scoop of each one and mix them up and measure the spectrum, <clears throat> the spectra are going to be the same kind of mixture. So if you take 50% of this one and 50% of this one and mix them up, then lay them out and make a measurement, the spectrum that you measure will be the 50-50 linear combination of the spectra on the pure materials. That's the underlying assumption. And as long as 
the mixture does not involve a chemical reaction, it's a very good assumption. That is how, how the measurement will work. So now I'm gonna tell you about a fun science problem that came to my beam line some years ago. <clears throat> I had this group of people who were economic geologists. Economic geologists are the people who try to understand how mineral formations happen in the earth. These folks were looking at a process that leads to a lot of the gold mines in South Africa. The way these places work, they're these sort of subterranean caverns, not caves of the sort that you can go into, but like fissures in the earth that open up so that water can pass through them. Life, being life, gets everywhere. And there are cyanobacteria that live in these deep subsurface fissures that survive not by energy from the sun because they never see the sun in this deep subsurface. Where they get their energy from is fluids from farther down in the mantle of the earth. As the mantle shifts and moves, it expresses the water and like pushes fluids up into these fissures higher up. There are energetic sulfur compounds in those fluids that wash over the cyanobacteria and the cyanobacteria metabolize those high energy sulfur compounds, reduce them to a, a lower enthalpy state and metabolize off of that difference in energy, which is kind of amazing. Life is amazing. It gets everywhere and it survives on everything. Now, what happens from time to time is that those fluids that come from farther down in the mantle might, be, might have some um, gold chloride in them. A lot of the gold that gets mined higher up in the mantle comes from deeper down in the mantle in this way. The gold chloride gets pushed up in these fluids. It washes over the cyanobacteria. The cyanobacteria lice because the gold chloride is a very caustic material. It breaks the cell wall open. The cyanobacteria spit out their guts as they die. And there are sulfur compounds in the interior of these cyanobacterial cells that reduce the gold chloride to metallic gold. Now, any individual example of this is a very small amount of gold chloride, but over geological time scales, these fissures can accumulate economically meaningful amounts of gold. So these folks came to me and asked, a quest asked two questions. One is, how fast does this chemical interaction take? That is, once these cyanobacteria cells are lysed, how long does it take the gold to reduce the gold chloride to reduce to metallic gold. And is it a one step process or a two or more step process? That is, does the gold chloride get reduced directly to zero valent metallic gold or does it go through a few chemical steps to get there? So the experiment that we designed to answer that question involved a little Teflon block with a slot cut in it. That slot was covered up with tape so that we could put a liquid that, so we had an Erlenmeyer flask with a nutrient solution in it and cyanobacteria growing in the nutrient solution. We pulled off a bit of the solution with healthy cyanobacteria in it and introduced it into this slot, sealed it off with tape so that it was just sitting there. We then took a syringe of gold chloride, squirted some gold chloride in and this happened, right? They were perfectly happy cyanobacteria going in. We then introduced a very severe environmental stressor and killed the cyanobacteria. We were mean. But in the process, we reduced the gold chloride to gold. After like, you know, the next day when this reaction was done, you could hold the sample up to the light and see the little flecks of gold in the sample that weren't there before. So. Here's what the data from the experiment looked like. Um, the, the blue spectrum is a spectrum that we measured on an aqueous solution of the gold three chloride. And it has this characteristic peak right after the edge. The 
quickest that we were able to make our first measurement because of some limitations of the experimental setup, our first time point is about six minutes after we introduced the gold to the gold, to the gold chloride to the cyanobacteria. You see that the sample with the cyanobacteria looks much like the gold chloride spectrum, but not exactly like. A gold foil looks like the green line here, and after a week, so this experiment had been done back in their lab and they brought a prepared sample to the beam line so that we could do the time sequence, but then also measure a week old sample. So the, the purple one is a sample that was done the same way as what we measured, but it had been sitting around for a week. And you can see that it has this characteristic peak that is associated with the gold metal that is absent in gold chloride, but it's not completely reduced to gold metal because there's still a little bit of a feature right here that corresponds to the original material. If you squint at this sequence of measurements, you see going from blue to yellow, you see that the first peak in the data is going down over time and the peak here, the corresponds so what you're seeing is those two features in the spectrum going like this as a function of time. We can do an analysis where we try and fit a measurement, and here's a measurement after seven hours, where we try and fit a measurement as a linear combination, some amount of gold metal, some amount of gold chloride, we can try and do the analysis and we don't get a very good result. We can't quite fit all of these features perfectly well until we introduce the spectrum of gold sulfide into the analysis. So what this is telling us is that at this intermediate point, seven hours into the experiment, <clears throat> The sample is not just a mixture of gold chloride and gold foil, gold metal. There's an additional species, a gold sulfide species of some sort. And to get a decent interpretation of the data, we have to introduce this third thing into the analysis. Having done that, we can do the whole time sequence and we see that as a function of time, the amount of gold goes up the amount of sulfide, go the amount of chloride goes down. And there's this sort of slightly more constant amount of sulfide always present in the sample. So this is very cool. The original questions were, what's the rate constant and is there an intermediate species? Well, by doing this linear combination analysis, we are able to come up with a rate constant for the reduction of gold metal, uh, for the creation of gold metal, a rate constant for the reduction of gold chloride, and we learn that there's an intermediate species of some kind of sulfur bound species of uh, one valent, plus one valent gold. So um, this is a bit more thoughtful analysis. We have to actually do the numerical analysis, but to do the numerical analysis, we also had to measure a whole bunch of uh, we measured a library of 12 or 15 gold species to account for the possibility of these different intermediate states. We had no knowledge going in of what the intermediate state was, so we just built a large library and tried the whole library against the data and came up with the unsurprising result, given that it was cyanobacteria, the unsurprising result that the intermediate species is a sulfur-bearing species. Um, there are a few other things that I'm going to talk about much less that are done with the Zanes. Um, there are, you will find papers where people do a kind of spectral decomposition of, of a Zane spectrum where they fit a sequence of step-like functions and peak-like functions and then try and understand differences between samples in terms of the differences in this group of peak-like functions. Um, it is often useful on some kind of sequence of data, but it's often hard to ascribe clear physical meaning to, um, 
to these peak-like functions, but this is a thing that you will see in the literature. Uh, you will see linear algebra approaches like principal components analysis. Um, this is something that you can use to look at an ensemble of data and come up with, um, there are, there's a, a tool that will tell you if a, a um, if an ensemble of data contains a certain standard, in this case, I did PCA on the uh, data, the data that I showed you on the, on the, you know, this time series that I just showed you. And I can show you from doing this linear, linear, linear algebra analysis that there is certainly metallic gold in this sequence of samples, but there is certainly not gold cyanide in this sequence of samples. Uh, so these linear combination approach, uh, these linear algebra approaches to ensembles of data are very commonly used in the literature also. A lot of things like um, uh, uh, magnetic circular dichroism um, are different spectra where you measure uh, a material under different applied magnetic fields or with different uh, senses of circular uh, polarization of the incident light and the different spectra can tell you something about magnetic moment and magnetic ordering. Uh, sometimes different spectra are used to quantify something that's going on during a chemical, a chemical reaction. Um, uh, uh, in this case, uh, I don't have a publication for it, but in this case what you're seeing is these subtle changes in platinum nanoparticles as uh, the surfaces of the nanoparticles get covered with hydrogen and to quantify, uh, you do a different spectrum to quantify the effect of the hydrogen on the zanes and try and correlate that with uh, performance of the nanoparticulate catalyst. Um, so those are the, uh, I explained one quantitative analysis approach in detail. Uh, three more I washed over really quickly just to give you a little bit of background. Uh, part three of the talk, I'm running a little bit short on time, so I'm I'm uh, I'm, I'm going to skip over this. You can read my lecture notes, and there's a lot of information available online. I will I will give you some uh, I will give you some uh, um, uh, references to to places you can go for more information at the end of the talk. But I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna do the annoying speaker thing of clicking through a bunch of slides here for a second. Um, my point is that. You get the Fourier transform spectrum that I showed you earlier is something that can be quantitatively analyzed. Here is the analysis on a well-known material, iron sulfide, uh, fool's gold, iron pyrite. Um, you can, knowing the structure of FES2, you can fully understand the oscillations that are measured in the XF spectrum. This is a teaching example that I use when I teach people how to do this stuff. Uh, I start with a known material and show them mechanically how to do the XS analysis and show them that you can get very good results. Then you can move on to much more complicated unknown situations. So here's a situation of a mineral, a, synthes a lab synthesized mineral that we wanted to prove that it had uranium five plus, a relatively unusual valence state of uranium. We wanted to prove that we had that in the material. And by doing, uh, by looking at the zanes and doing some complicated analysis with the XFs, we were able to demonstrate that in fact, we did have a mineral that had some of its uranium in the five plus state. Um, again, bringing this knowledge of XS analysis to the problem, we're able to do really detailed analysis of all of those oscillations in the extended spectrum. Um, uh, just another example of some kind of complicated analysis and learning something about doing this kind of analysis. Sort of, I, I, I surely don't have the time. I, I, I normally spend, when I, when I give a, an XS training course, I will spend two full days explaining how to do this kind of stuff. I'm just showing you this now as a little bit of flavor so that you can understand and take away the notion that this complicated structure can be interpreted um, to give you detailed information about how atoms stack together to make things. Um, another example of a, a colleague of mine who had um, 
Uh, these mang manganese zinc ferrite nanoparticles, this is a uh, material with an interesting magnetic response. It has a lot of industrial applications. And he was able to figure out how these three very similar transition metals occupy the different metal sites in this ferrite structure. So you can get really a lot of information out of this kind of analysis. Not giving you any of the details of how it's done, just some of the flavor that you can get this kind of information out of XFs if you, if you apply yourself. I sped through that because I want to end my talk and use the, the last like 20 minutes of my talk to uh, show you a real world example of a question that can be asked and an answer that can be provided using the stuff I've been talking about for the last, uh, the last couple of hours. So, here is a picture of my house. This is the house I'm sitting in right now. It's a, a picture of my garden, which is just, just right over there. Um, this picture is taken on the day that I purchased my house. This is my real estate agent. And the house, when I bought it, had this wooden deck off of the kitchen and dining area. Here's a much more recent picture of the side of my house. I've replaced the wooden deck with a paver stone patio. And you can see also, I mean, it's kind of weedy and messy right here, but you can see that I, I, I have a vegetable garden. So this area right here where there was this sort of Christmas tree thing, I took out the Christmas tree so that I could plant vegetables there, but I also took out this wooden deck. The main reason I took out the wooden deck is because it was in kind of bad shape and I couldn't walk on it barefoot without like risk of splinter. But there's another reason I wanted to take out the wooden deck. And that is because a lot of wood that's used in construction of this sort is pressure treated wood. What does pressure treated wood mean? Well, pressure treatment is a thing that is a wood preservative. It helps wood last longer when exposed to the elements. How does that work? Well, this same chemical isn't commonly used today in 2020, but back when that patio was built, this was the common way of doing pressure treatment. You would put a chemical called, it's, um, it's a, um, a chromium bearing analog of copper ortho arsenate. It's this material. Here's the little, uh, little diagram of it. It's dissolved in water. The wood is put into a vessel. The vessel is brought up to pressure and that drives the water bearing copper ortho arsenate into the fibers of the wood. Why do they do this? Well, chromium bearing copper ortho arsenate is a really good preservative because the two things that the two things that break down wood when exposed to the environment are insects which eat the um, cellulose out of the wood and fungus, which eats the cellulose out of the wood. When you remove the cellulose, you're left with that sort of brittle honeycomb-like structure of lignin, which easily breaks. So lignin is super strong as long as the cavities are filled up with cellulose. When the cellulose gets eaten out by things, the lignin becomes weak and the wood breaks. So if you put copper in the wood, the fungus doesn't grow in the wood. And if you put chromium and arsenic in the wood, insects don't eat the wood because they don't wanna eat poison. The problem is that pressure treated wood is known to leach all three of those elements out of the wood into the surrounding soil. There's a whole literature out there of people who have studied this, people who have studied like fence posts in farmland and taken soil samples at different distances away from the fence post. And there is very clearly uh, chromium and copper and arsenic leaching out of pressure treated wood. So if we go back to this picture, I am growing vegetables in my vegetable garden, things that I intend to eat. I am growing those right next to where this pressure treated wood patio used to be. So. How much arsenic is in the soil? And is it higher right here near my patio? Is it higher than farther away from where the old pressure treated wood was? And what's the chemical species of the arsenic? 
So I'm going to answer those two questions by showing you some XRF spectra and some XF spectra. Let me walk you through how I did that. I took a little bit of soil from the garden. So technically what I did is I scraped away a little bit from the top and I took a scoop of soil from right next to where the patio used to be. I then took a spot about five meters away and slightly uphill from where the old deck was. So water would wash down towards the deck. So the deck cannot possibly be contaminating the soil from that spot five meters away because the hydrological gradient is down. So I did the same thing. I scraped away the surface and took a little bit of soil from underneath. I put them in a little plastic frame and covered it up with tape. That way I could just hold it up in the beam. Very simple sample prep. I literally took a chunk of soil slapped it in this little frame and put it in the x-ray beam. The red spectrum is the one from five meters away. The blue spectrum is the one from right next to the deck. This position right here is where the arsenic is. And you can see very clearly that there's an enhancement of arsenic in the soil close to where the deck, where the patio used to be. Um, the chromium signal is a lot smaller, but you can see also that the chromium signal is enhanced. Um, the copper signal might be enhanced. I, I find it a little harder to tell in this case, uh, but the arsenic is certainly enhanced relative to the soil from five meters away. So that sort of, that partially answers thing number one. Thing number one is there is more arsenic in the soil near where the patio used to be. Okay, to get started in understanding the second question, what is the species of the arsenic in the soil that I'm growing vegetables in? Here are some inorganic standards. This is basically just uh, arsenic three plus and arsenic five plus dissolved in water. Uh, you know, the pH balanced water so that the arsenic stays in that species. And you see that there's a significant difference between arsenic 3 plus and arsenic 5 plus. Um, difference in the size of the white line, <coughs> but also in the position of the rising edge. Now, you in general want to know the species of things because the, the valence state will tell you something about the toxicity of the metal, but it will also tell you something about the mobility of the metal. Um, in the case of arsenic, um, they're both pretty toxic and they're both pretty mobile. Um, in the case of chromium, like I talked about earlier, there was a big distinction between chromium three plus and chromium six plus. Chromium three plus not really being a problem to health and chromium six plus being a huge problem to health. Um, arsenic is always bad for you. But really understanding the details of the transport of arsenic, you, 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 need to know what, you need to know what you're working with. So this is what three plus and five plus look like. Here are the spectra that I measured. And I'm, the colors are the same as two slides ago. So the red one is the spectrum that I measured from the soil taken five meters away from the old patio. And again, you see that the scale of things is considerably lower than, than the spectrum from adjacent to the old patio. So there, again, there's more arsenic close to the old patio than five meters away. The problem is that, that it, it's a little bit hard to tell what's going on with the chemistry of the arsenic with the unprocessed data. So if I process the data so that everything has a, a, a unit edge step, everything goes from zero to one, that lets us take out the problem of concentration and focus on the problem of chemistry. And we see that both of these spectra from the soils are predominantly arsenic 5 plus. But if you squint at this, you see that the two soil samples start turning up a little bit earlier than the arsenic 5 plus inorganic standard. I can do that kind of linear combination analysis on these spectra and I find out that the soil is about 95% arsenic 5 plus and about 3% arsenic, uh, about 5% arsenic 3 plus. Um, and I did that by just doing that linear combination analysis of the green and purple spectra using 
the blue and red spectra as the fitting standards in the analysis. So I've demonstrated that there is more arsenic in that one spot in my vegetable, vegetable garden. And I've demonstrated that the arsenic is predominantly arsenic five plus. So should I be worried about eating the produce from my garden? That seems like a really valid question. Okay, so to try and start to get a handle on that, I did this measurement. Now, if any of you out there listening to me, if any of you are soil scientists or um, know something about X-ray fluorescence detectors and are worried about the measurement science, there are some flaws in what I'm about to show you, but I'm gonna qualify those afterwards. But what I'm showing you is spectra taken on the leaf of a squash plant growing in that spot in my garden. And I, I'm showing you the spectra measured above and below the absorption edge to try and make it clear if there's an arsenic peak. And to my eye, there's no evidence of arsenic in the leaf of the squash plant. So even though toxic arsenic 5 plus is elevated in the soil where the squash is growing, there doesn't seem to be elevated amounts of arsenic in the leaf of the squash plant. Um, here's some of the fruit of the squash plant. I grow really delicious squash. I eat them all summer long. Now, what are the problems with what I'm showing you and why am I not concerned about it? I don't eat the squash leaf. I eat the squash fruit. I didn't take a spectrum on the fruit because, you know, I want to eat that for dinner. I don't want to chop it up and use it for science. So I, I, I show you a leaf spectrum and not a vegetable spectrum. So that's one flaw. Another flaw is that the, here in the United States, the Food and Drug Administration, the Federal Food and Drug Administration provides guidance for what the maximum amounts of arsenic you can have in things that are meant to be consumed as food that level is actually too low to measure at a beamline like mine. So there might be dangerous amounts of arsenic here in the squash leaf, but I can't measure it at the beamline because the detection limit is here and the FDA limit is, is way down here. However, plants go to great lengths to keep contaminants out of their reproductive organs, right? The squash the part of the squash that we eat has the seeds in it. And plants use one of two strategies predominantly to keep things like arsenic out of the fruit, away from the seeds. What squash plants do is they do take arsenic up through the vascular system, you know, like up through the roots and through the plants, but they tend to push the contaminants out to the leaves and express them out through the pores of the leaves so that the rainwater washes it away. Uh, basically, a lot of plants like this just cycle arsenic through their body and go to like biochemical lengths to keep the arsenic out of the fruit of the plant. So um, the squash are not only delicious, they're still safe to eat, even though I've demonstrated that there's elevated arsenic in that spot in my garden. Cool. So the point of this was to just give you sort of a fun example of a real but relatable science problem and how I posed a question and answered it using the x-rays. So this brings me to the end of my talk. I want to leave you with a few sources of information. If you want to learn about the synchrotron where I work uh, here in New York State in the United States, uh, here's our URL. Uh, you all should eventually have a copy of this talk, so you'll, you'll have a copy of this PDF file. Uh, lightsources.org is a really neat place to learn about synchrotron science in general. There are links to all the synchrotrons around the world, and there's quite a number of them at this point. Um, xfs.org, that's a little bit out of date, but you will be redirected to the new site. Uh, that's a great place to learn some more about absorption spectroscopy. This is a book that you can order from Amazon or really any other place where you get books. It's a bit pricey, but it's by far the best book for learning about XF. So if any of you 
will be coming to a synchrotron anytime soon and doing some excess, I highly recommend this book. It's really excellent. Um, you can go to the, so if you squint here in this tiny text, you can see the new URL. I, I really need to update this apparently. So if you go to xrayabsorption.org, there's a tutorials page that provides links to lots of information, including um, uh, all the talks that I give on this topic and lots of other really smart people also. Uh, and finally, if you um, are planning to measure things, there is freely available software, um, free in every sense. It's free to use, it's free to look at the source code and it's free to redistribute. So there are resources out there for you to use uh, when it comes time to do excess. So, um, that is the end of my talk. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave I'm gonna leave this slide up while I'm talking. Um, I have a few questions here, and if any of you have any other questions on the stuff I talked about at any time through the last couple of hours, uh, please go ahead and post them. We'll spend a few minutes getting through them. Um, uh, so, Sal, should I go ahead and answer these questions now, or do you do you have some other business that you need to take care of before uh, I answer the questions? Uh, no, it's uh, all you. Answer the questions. Okie dokie. So question one, I haven't read these yet because I've been yapping. Um, if you have a bimetallic sample with both metals being in the same oxidation state, would you be able to tell that there are two metal centers or will it show as just one line? Great question. So I want to bring you back to the very early part of the talk where I talked about how different elements on the periodic table have different characteristic energies. So if you have, say, a bimetallic nanoparticle, like say um, gold palladium or something like that. You can do the experiment first at the gold edge and second at the palladium edge. So when you have a bimetallic sample, you can measure the two metals independently and measure their valence state and their structural environment independently. And very often in a bimetallic sample, you need to do that because you need to understand how both parts of the sample see the surroundings and what chemical state both are in. And what's more, as you do a chemistry experiment on a bimetallic sample, one metal might respond differently than the other one. So one might start to oxidize or reduce before the other. And you can certainly see that in excess measurements. And the reason that works is because every element has its characteristic absorption uh, energy so that you can measure each one individually. The other what's more is that if you have a bimetallic sample, you can measure very different amounts of the metals. So they could be a 50-50 mixture, but they could also be a 1%, 99% mixture, and you can still easily measure both metals in the bimetallic sample. It's one of the great strengths of XFs is that you get to look at each metal in a sample individually. Uh, can you explain how the pre-edge peak occurs at energies below the K-edge? Um, so I, I, I can. Um, the, the, to start thinking about the answer, we have to take a big step back uh, to the very beginning of the talk where I talked about the X-ray coming in and promoting the deep core electron. Um, then some other electron falls back down and fills the hole. Uh, in quantum mechanics terms, both ends of that interaction, the excitation and the de-excitation, are a dipole interaction, which means that the electron has to change angular momentum state, so the L quantum number. It has to change angular momentum by one. It can't do anything else. The 1s electron has to go to a 2p state. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry, the, the 1s electron goes out and the 1s core hole gets refilled by a 2p state. It's the only way for that to happen. What's more, the 1s electron, when it goes out, it has to go into some high-lying p state. It has to end up in a state with p character. So where the Fermi energy is and where the first state that you can excite the 1s electron into are not necessarily the same energy. In a metal, they are. 
That's what defines a metal. The Fermi energy is in the middle of a conduction band. In an oxide, there's a conduction band. The Fermi energy, the position of the Fermi energy is sort of ill-determined because the electron states are filled all the way up to the bottom of the valence band, and then there's a gap, and then there are states above the gap. So the Fermi energy is in one place, but the first state that's available to excite into is at a much higher energy. That's the main rising edge. Now, because of distortions in the atomic structure, those distortions can lead to interesting states that hybridize, that, that are hybridizations of electron states with different L characters. So you can hybridize P and D states that can open up very low density states within the band gap that have enough P character that the 1s electron can go into them. So those pre-edge peaks, I, I, I mentioned in passing that the phrase pre-edge peak is troublesome from a physics perspective, and it's because they're not before anything. They're, they're above the Fermi energy. Those are unoccupied states that are available for the 1s electron to go into, but they're called pre-edge peaks as a sort of semantic thing because they show up before the main rising edge. So it's the way you phrase the question is not quite fully acknowledging the details of the electronic structure of real materials. The Fermi energy is the Fermi energy, but you have to excite the 1s electron into an available state with P character. I hope that seemed like a kind of technical question. I hope I adequately answered your question. Um, I hope that was good enough. That's, that's kind of a tough one to do in 60 seconds at the end of a long talk, but I hope that was a good answer. Okay, um, final question. Sometimes it is difficult to fabricate suspected impurities in pure form or intermediates form during a chemical reaction so that you can measure them and do the fitting with the data. Can you calculate zanes either from a SIF uh, a SIF file, which is a SIF is a, a kind of thing that encodes crystal structures. Um, if crystalline or any available chemical information and do the fitting using the calculated zanes. Uh, in principle, yes. In practice, it is a problem of um, uh, active study. So the calculations are very, very challenging and they are just starting to get to be good enough to do what you are asking about. Um, they're pretty expert only calculations. They're not yet broadly available. So doing those kinds of Zane's calculations are challenging. Um, in practice, what people often do is either use surrogates for these unknown structures or just say, here's the analysis I did. There's clearly something unknown that's missing um, that gives rise to such and such a feature and, you know, sort of uh, describe it more qualitatively. The quantitative analysis that you're asking about using pure theory, we're still a little ways away from being able to do that regularly, but there are super smart people working on exactly that problem. Um, oh yeah, and then the fellow who asked about the pre-edge peak pointed out that I got the formula wrong for chromate, for potassium chromate. Uh, he points out that the correct formula is K2CrO4, unless I meant dichromate, uh, K2Cr2O7. I'm sure I meant one of those. Uh, thank you for pointing out a bug in my talk. Um, it's amazing how many years such things can stick around until uh, somebody as uh, sharp as you is actually paying attention. So, Raphael, thank you for that. I will most assuredly fix that. Um, that's great. Uh, and then uh, last last comment is just uh, thanking me for a nice talk. No, thank you. I'm really, that's really touching. Thank you for sticking out through a very long talk, and I'm really glad you enjoyed it. Um, hopefully some, hopefully, you know, so the very best thing that could come out of a talk like this is if someday I see one of you at my beamline measuring XF. So hopefully that will happen someday. And with that, Sal, I will turn it back over to you.
All right, I would like to uh, thank everybody for attending and I would like to thank you, Dr. Bruce Ravel, uh, for the talk. It's always cool listening to you. Oh, thank uh, you. And uh, that's it, thank you very much. I will be emailing out the material later today or when I get it and thank you. Yeah, and everybody have a great day or evening or whatever time zone you're in. It was lovely talking to you.